Bitcoin transaction fees surpassed the block subsidy for the first time ever. Bitcoin block rewards are, of course, comprised of the block subsidy, which is new Bitcoin that is issued as of right now. That's 6.25 Bitcoin with each block and transaction fees. And for the first time ever, transaction fees were so large at block number 788,695. In fact, they were 6.701 Bitcoin, so roughly uh, nearly uh, rather half a Bitcoin higher than the block subsidy. This is absolutely historic, and it is indicative of ever rising demand for block space on Bitcoin's blockchain. So we're going to talk about all about what this means and the implications for it up next. First, a word from our sponsor, Passport. Passport is the Bitcoin hardware wallet that you already know how to use with this gorgeous design and its very familiar interface. Passport makes it easier than ever to self-custody your Bitcoin. If you've been on the fence about self-custodying your Bitcoin and leave, left it on an exchange up to this point, look no further. Passport is your solution. You can go to the bitcoinlayer.com slash foundation and use codes bitcoinlayer for $10 off your purchase. Now, on with the video. So the block in question where this happened occurred on Sunday. Again, it was block height 788,695. And the mempool has since cleared and transaction fees are now moving closer to uh, right around two Bitcoin per block off of nearly three times that, uh, over three times that rather when the when the mempool was so clear. But this is a historic moment regardless. Uh, and the mempool is still relatively clogged. Uh, as of right now, you can take a look at this picture right here. It is moving along at a crisp 100 sats per V-byte but it rose as high as 654 sats per V-byte, which is $26 at, at today's exchange rate at its peak. It's getting very expensive for people, people to move Bitcoin across the network. There's extremely high demand. In fact, even right now it's elevated, right? I mentioned it's 100 sats per V-byte. It's usually even closer to one sat per V-byte, and V-byte stands for virtual byte. And you'll take a look at this chart here. Again, there are 307,000 uh, transactions that are waiting to be confirmed onto the blockchain. Bitcoin's block space is very clogged right now. Well, why is this? What's going on? Well, there are a couple of different things happening here. Number one is BRC20 tokens, named after a similar thing that's happening on Ethereum, uh, which essentially use units of Bitcoin as vessels for minting, sending, and receiving uh, unique assets with the use of Bitcoin wallets. Now, you think this, you think, oh, shit, coins are running on top of Bitcoin. Well, you're not entirely wrong, right? But this isn't like the Ethereum network whereby there are other chains and all there are several different assets and they're all moving across Ethereum. No, 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 right? The, the idea of Ethereum is, is vastly different from the way that the Bitcoin network works. In fact, what's happening here is vastly different. This is more of a social layer or an observational layer atop the Bitcoin network rather than something like Ethereum where the actual assets are moving on the Ethereum network uh, when it comes to what's happening right now with these ordinal inscriptions and these BRC20 tokens, it's essentially using Bitcoin, the asset, as a vessel to send and receive unique assets only to and from unique Bitcoin wallets that are compatible with this viewing mechanism, right? And so it's essentially a method of observing Bitcoin and denoting individual Satoshis that not all wallets need to be aware of. And so it's not making any changes to Bitcoin's protocol, right? And therefore it doesn't have any impact on the, of course, 21 million supply cap or any of the other, uh, you know, rules that have been there since the beginning and have come since that are on the uh, white paper behind me. All of Bitcoin's rule set is still intact. Again, really all that these BRC20 tokens and ordinal inscriptions are allowing people to do uh, are basically ordering and numbering individual Satoshis, uh, which are individual units of Bitcoin, with their own unique value. And again, this is a social sort of observational layer to Bitcoin. This isn't native to the first layer of the protocol. This, you know, other wallets don't have to be compatible with what this is. But basically, it's a method of bringing other assets into the ecosystem without actually doing so, if that makes sense. Using Bitcoin, the asset, and numbering it in a certain way to view it a certain way. Uh, and that's basically the workaround in order to bring these other assets onto Bitcoin. Now, shit coins aren't actually native to Bitcoin. This is merely a way to observe Bitcoin. There are no changes to Bitcoin's code base when these new assets are created. But that said, it is a mechanism. It is this social layer that drives demand for block space. And hence, that is what you're seeing here. Take a look at a couple of stats on ordinal inscriptions here and, and these BRC20 tokens as a whole. You can see that BRC20 token transactions have absolutely exploded uh, to well over, as of right now, 200,000 transactions per day, uh, more than 100 Bitcoin 
is being used in these BRC20 transactions up from basically absolutely nothing just a few months ago. You can take a look at here. This is the percentage of Bitcoin transactions in ordinals. Uh, ordinal transactions and non-ordinal transactions and you can see that normal everyday non-ordinal bitcoin transactions now make up less than half of total transactions so the reason that transaction fees are so high that block space is so clogged and people are really trying to move bitcoin across the network and willing to pay a high fee for doing so is because they're clogged with these brc20 tokens and these ordinal inscriptions right it, you know these pictures of monkeys these pictures of wizards the the demand to send them to and from bitcoin wallets is clogging up bitcoin's block space so regardless of what you or I think, it's quite beneficial for mining economics. Let's take a look here at this chart. This is what's called hash price. This is the marginal revenue for the production of Bitcoin. For each additional unit of Bitcoin mine, how much is a miner earning? And we denote this in dollars per terahash expended per day, right? So for each additional unit of energy, how many new dollars are coming into existence denominated in Satoshi's? Back here in March, the marginal revenue for miners actually bottomed at six cents per terahash per day. So six cents per unit of energy expended each day. And now it's all the way up to over 12 at its height, right? So the marginal revenue for miners is doubling. That, that's pretty good for them, right? I can't imagine they're too upset about that. Another uh, chart here that shows that miners are very, very happy. Take a look. This is record high transaction fees of $17.8 million just two days ago. So this is re really phenomenal stuff. And regardless of whether or not you like it, ultimately, this is making the network more robust, more resilient, more securitized, uh, rather not securitized, but more secure. And at the end of the day, it'll make it more efficient because it'll drive competition for miners who are trying to get on the network and, uh, you know, reclaim these rewards. Uh, and so they're going to become ever more efficient and we'll get a more secure network as a result of it. So again, at the end of the day, you guys might not be fans of it, but it's driving the security budget of the Bitcoin network all the same. And you'll take a look at this chart here. This is the mean fee reward per block. And this really just is another way of illustrating what we talked about in the beginning in that transaction fees have now surpassed the block subsidy as a percentage of the total block space, the total block reward that miners receive. Very remarkable stuff. Again, whether you like it or hate it, this is great for miners. And there's one last chart that we will take a look at here. Two last charts, rather. Uh, the first one is the number of transactions by relative fee. And you can see here that in the red, this is high priority transactions. So basically, people are willing to pay 50 sats per V-byte, which is absolutely huge, in order to get their transactions confirmed on the blockchain, right? So for everyday users, and even for these people who are using ERC20 or BRC20 tokens, rather, ordinal inscriptions in general, anybody wants to use Bitcoin's main blockchain. It's getting clogged. And unless you are moving extremely large financial transactions, this isn't the most efficient thing in the universe. And also Bitcoin's blockchain is projected to grow much higher uh, in size as a result of this. Take a look at this. So this is basically a projection created by Glassnode if blocks are, are full at 1.35 megabytes, 2.5 megabytes and 4 megabytes per block. And you could see if we get those maximally filled blocks at 4 megabytes through history, you're going to see uh, Bitcoin's total blockchain grew much, much larger. And of course, the cost to run a node will grow along with that. But ultimately, let's take a step back, guys, and understand what this is for what it is. Uh, I mentioned that none of our opinions really matter on this, but let's get down to the nitty gritty, right? This is a feather in Bitcoin's cap as it continues to monetize. There was a stage where this point was going to come. Right, whether it comes now or whether it comes a decade from now, we understand that Bitcoin's block space is limited because it needs to be limited. Right, if Bitcoin is going to monetize into this global base layer reserve asset that financial institutions hold on their balance sheet, right, businesses and uh, you know these these banks uh, all around the world, then demand for block space on Bitcoin's blockchain would inevitably be taken up by ever larger financial transactions. It's just the way that it was going to go from the outset. Right, think of uh, think of SWIFT, right, the current cross border order interbank uh, system whereby people send money to and from. That's what Bitcoin's blockchain was always going to become. There's Bitcoin the asset and the Bitcoin the network and Bitcoin the network is slow, clunky and has limited space by design. Get used to it. Right? At the end of the day, this is going to continue. You can take a look at this chart here. Bitcoin supply schedule is only going to continue decreasing. It's going to get cut in half every four years until 2140. And so transaction fees basically being the primary source of revenue for miners is going to become the norm eventually. So get used to this. Just like every other money that begins as a commodity, Bitcoin has to scale in layers. Look at the name of the channel of the video that you were watching. Look at this sign up here, the Bitcoin layer. It has been a part of our fundamental framework since day one. Nick wrote his book, of course, Layered Money, about 
how monetary systems scale in layers and Bitcoin is that base layer and one day in a potential future, it could be a base layer reserve asset of the world financial system. We certainly believe that it could be. And Bitcoin is the base layer, the main blockchain of its own monetary network. And Bitcoin, like these other assets like gold and dollars, Bitcoin is scaling in layers too. Right now, Bitcoin's base layer is slow and clunky because it has to be. Right. That's the idea of Bitcoin. And ultimately, other layers of technology built atop Bitcoin, such as the Lightning Network, demand for block space, this huge demand whereby people can't even transact on chain at a reasonable fee. And sometimes the fee to transact costs more than the actual thing that you are purchasing or the amount you're sending. That's going to drive capital. That's going to drive human innovation onto these secondary layers. And as more uh, capital gets onto these layers, not just from the development standpoint, but from funding opening lightning channels, that's going to become ever more efficient and ever more secure too. And so that's just the nature of the beast. That's the nature of what we're dealing with here. Ultimately, we get a much more resilient base layer, a much more secure base layer, and we get a far more developed secondary layer where it has all the liquidity we need to eventually meet these transactions that can't be accommodated on the base layer, which will be taken up by these larger, think colossal, multi-million dollar interbank uh, sort of uh, funding, uh, interbank uh, transactions rather, those are the types of transactions that are going to occur on Bitcoin's blockchain. This was inevitable, this has been talked about for years, and even though we might be seeing a glimpse of it now and it might return to normal uh, as it has been for the time being with low sats per V-byte, this is a preview of the future. Price is truth, and at the end of the day, people are paying for this block space because they demand the commodity and to use the network that that commodity rests on, right? At the end of the day, price is truth, and you can't argue with the fact that Bitcoin is growing in its use, judging by what we're seeing right now. And we get, again, a more resilient, a more secure, and ultimately a more efficient network because of it. Regardless of what you think of ordinals, of BRC tokens, etc., it drives demand and capital and development to scaling solutions adjacent to and on top of Bitcoin, like the Lightning Network, which is our preferred layer two and the one that we've spoken about and written several pieces about in the past. Ultimately, these tokens, ordinal inscriptions, and any other ones that come down the line, they are a method of observing Bitcoin. And love it or hate it, it functions within the parameters and rules set by the Bitcoin network. And at the end of the day, just like every other instrument that has been created and will continue being created atop of Bitcoin, it drives liquidity. That's all for today's video. Thank you guys so much for joining. A little bit more of a brief one today, but I hope you got a lot out of it. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss when we upload next. Take care, everyone. The Bitcoin layer is sponsored by Foundation Devices. Foundation Devices are the creators of the Passport Bitcoin hardware wallet, the Bitcoin hardware wallet that you already know how to use. Guys, it's got a gorgeous design. It's got a very sleek interface, very great screen, directional pad that everyone knows how to use. It makes Bitcoin storage easy and accessible to just about everybody. If you've been put off in the past from taking your Bitcoin off exchanges, which we highly advise that you do, your Bitcoin isn't really there. These are fractionally reserved institutions. Look no further. This is extremely simple. Everyone already knows how to use it right out of the box. And better yet, you can get $10 off your purchase when you use code BitcoinLayer at checkout. Go to the BitcoinLayer.com slash foundation to get yours today.